So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Jamo for Corda on Chainstack. Um, it's going to be a packed evening. Um, we are going to have a, a great, uh, great lineup of, of uh, speakers today. There is Eugene, uh, CTO of Chainstack, Tim, uh, head of Emerging Badgers. Uh, can I ask, please, everyone to mute themselves, uh, whether that's on the panelist side or on the speakers and on the attendees, please. <laughs> we wouldn't want to have uh, too much background noise. Great. Uh, Simon is here, a technical leader of Digital Asset, and I'm Alex, I'm Director of Sales and Marketing for Chainsack. So um, we have a packed evening. Uh, the agenda uh, you probably have seen. Uh, we will have a first a presentation of Damo and Chainstack as to technologies and how they come together. We're going to look and have a crash course on how to model on Damo. That's a session that, um, that Simon will lead. Uh, then we will move on how to spinning up a Corda network on Chainstack. And that's a session that Eugene will, uh, will lead. And then we're gonna get on the juicy part, which is on actually demonstrating how to deploy a Corda app and execute transaction on Damo uh, for Corda using, using Chainstack. We will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. However, if you do have questions all throughout uh, the session, please do take some time uh, to post on the chat. Uh, the, the chat will be mounted um, and taken care of uh, all throughout. So without further ado, uh, let's take a few minutes to take a look a bit of more in detail um, about uh, Chainstack, what it does, what it is, and then we move on to, to, to take a look instead uh, um, at, at Damo. So what is Chainstack? Um, it's the, it's a blockchain managed services and it's a platform that will allow to deploy, manage and scale um, any uh, blockchain solution uh, based uh, on a number of protocols and uh, with a number of cloud solutions as well. So from experimentation to production, uh, we have a solution that will enable um, at any stage uh, the, uh, the scaling and the deployment uh, of, of blockchain applications or throughout. As you can see, the protocols that we cover are um, uh, all the major uh, protocols that you can see from Corda to Hyperledger Fabric, Consensus Quorum, Multichain, Bitcoin and Ethereum. We are actually actively scouting for the new additions to our, to our uh, rooster. So if you do have suggestions on what should be uh, the next steps, please do. Alex, I'm afraid you've got on mute. Uh, we missed about 30 seconds. Okay. Okay, let me also, let, let, let me ask uh, Nick, can you please let people in uh, and, and admit them? Awesome. So uh, as Chainstack, uh, as Chainstack deployment goes, uh, we go from experimentation to production and Chainstack provides uh, everything that you need to build and scale your solution on a number of protocols. As you can see, there's Corda, Hyperledger Fabric, Consensus Quorum, Multichain, Bitcoin, and Ethereum on both um, the um, uh, testnet and mainnet. And in terms of cloud deployment, we have Google Cloud, AWS, uh, Azure, and on the pipeline, and there are DigitalOcean and Alibaba Cloud. If you do have any suggestions on who should be the next addition to our protocol booster, do please make uh, sure to suggest it on our chat. Um, a number of innovators of any size are trusting us uh, from uh, system integrators and consulting companies all the way to innovators within the crypto space, whether that's on, uh, uh, on uh, analytics, fintech products, uh, or, or a number of cybersecurity solutions. So we are built to run uh, in, in a, the most flexible way. So flexibility with no protocol lock-in. Uh, you can deploy on CREM and, and on hybrid fashion in addition to on cloud. Um, we, uh, we are a trusted uh, ally when it comes to deploying even complex solutions uh, for enterprises. And uh, we have a team of highly experienced engineers. You will get a taste uh, from uh, Eugene's today on what it means to really push the boundaries and get at the cutting edge of blockchain DevOps. As far as uh, 
the uh, nature of our platform, it wants to be the most developer friendly uh, platform uh, for developers and enterprise developers in particular. So it's been built by developers uh, to developers. And we want to uh, make sure that the experience is not just seamless, but it's superior. And you will see that uh, the, the interface today, you get, a, you get a feel for it, um, thanks to, to the demo. Uh, the outside feels very simple and, and very, uh, uh, very streamlined, seamless, absolutely seamless. Um, however, you will see that a lot of engineering has gone into the making of it. Uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of work that has gone into standardization and automation of the ingestions of both the protocols and the cloud solution. So it's a turnkey solution uh, where you can just start in a few, few clicks and I encourage everyone today to just open an account. It's free for the first 15 days, play around. Um, and after that, if you want to get a bit more granular on the type of support that you want to see, um, then you can also use uh, our quite nifty um, estimation calculator on the website. It will give you a very precise right, rundown in a transparent way of uh, any, any type of protocols and any type of you know, length and number of nodes, you can get that uh, quite in a precise way. And uh, there are a number of bespoke and tailored deployments as well. We can cater for a more complex uh, requirements, whether that's for banks or uh, whether it's more sensitive data uh, on bespoke uh, on-prem deployment. For that, uh, please do reach out. We are happy uh, to, to give you a bit of a more insight of what that, that actually means. So just to recap, uh, Chainstack is an enterprise uh, great software. Um, it comes from an experienced team uh, that has made a point of making it as flexible as possible, giving enterprise developers the freedom to choose the right solution without any protocol looking. It's optimized for growth, so it doesn't it does take you from the early stages and POC all the way to scaling up, uh, you know, to the hundreds of networks. Uh, in the same same uh, friendly way with the same user interface and the same uh, dashboard for, for managing it. And in terms of deployment, it's flexible. You can deploy on cloud with all the major clouds and major geographies. You can also deploy on-prem and you can go all the way um, on, on any type of combination in a hybrid way. Uh, I hope this gave uh, a, you know, a decent rundown of what Chainstack does. I'm, I'm going to pass it on to Tim. Um, that would explain what um, Daniel does and is. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, just a quick thumbs up, Alex, if you don't mind, if you can hear me properly. Sure. Um, okay, you good? Good, you can. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I want to just take a quick step back and talk about blockchains and smart contracts just for a couple of minutes before we, uh, we jump into the demo of this. Um, and I want to set... Um, you know, it's a little bit of groundwork so that we're all um, understanding the decisions that we've made at Digital Asset, why we came up with DAML in the first place, uh, why it's interesting for you guys that we have DAML available on Chainstack now with Corda, and how the whole thing fits together. Um, so if you think back to sort of the genesis of the, of the, the industry that we're all in, um, the creation of blockchains, they were really um, a mechanism for parties that don't have any particular interest in, in running a mutual piece of infrastructure and in sharing costs on their infrastructure um, to agree on what truth happens to be at a given point in time. Um, that's really what a blockchain is. It's basically a distributed database that um, doesn't assume any particular um, uh, trust or shared ownership over it with the, with the parties that contribute. And it's a mechanism for delivering that truth or delivering that state to all the different parties who happen to be using it. Um, I won't go into the whole history of Bitcoin and how consensus works. I think everybody understands all of that. But just take that first piece as, as a bit of groundwork that um, blockchains are a mechanism for sharing truth among parties. Um, there isn't any uh, real control over the validity of that truth beyond um, Alex. There's a there's a comment in chat from um, from some of the Wipro folks unable to get in. I just want to draw your attention to that. Um, thank you. The, the there isn't any um, real control over the over you know what a valid state happens to be beyond really basic stuff like no double spending. Um, for this reason, uh, using blockchains as a way to distribute state around tends to work where um, you have truly unilateral changes of state. Uh, what I mean by that is one party can affect a state change 
uh, without anybody else really having to agree it. Uh, meaning I can, it's like, well, the way that ends up being used is I can send you some money. I can pay Alex uh, a bunch of coins on the ledger. Uh, maybe if I'm running my inventory management on it, I can update that I sold a few widgets in my own shop, uh, my physical location, and there's a few less available for other people to purchase online. Um, I can, uh, you know, put an order in for something for somebody else. There's no, there's no real concept of um, a process. It's a single atomic unilateral action that we take. Um, so for that reason, it's actually fairly bad for stuff like business processes, which tend to operate in um, much more of a process driven way. You know, there's an agreed sequence of events that happens in order to get to an outcome. Um, parties involved in a business transaction will you know, engage in some round of negotiations, first of all, over how much they want and how much it's worth paying. Um, there'll be some state changes there around the fact that something's been shipped. Uh, there'll be some tracking information. And I'm just thinking about a, a very simple use case here. Um, and in, in those circumstances, there actually are, uh, there's a flow of legal states that, that needs to uh, be controlled and governed for. There's, there's a, a bunch of, there's not, not you purely, pure, there's not purely unilateral actions that are being taken here. Um, I deliver something, you were sent to receive it, um, and so on. So um, the, the way that the, uh, blockchain technology has come up with a solution for that, you know, to, to basically control or limit the set of legal states and how they evolve is to uh, create something called smart contracts, which are, um, uh, if you think about it in computer science terms, basically a mechanism for creating a distributed state machine and processing the, or controlling and describing the, uh, the events that can occur from the outside world and the legal sets of states and transitions that occur between them. Um, that's what a, a smart contract fundamentally is. It's a mechanism to agree how state changes, uh, what the legal state is, and what are the consequences of that state happening. And that gets you into something which is very closely aligned with how business processes actually occur, where you have a process, you have a procedure, you have a, a book that describes how something should occur and something should evolve. So they're a necessary first step in getting blockchain technology really able to be adopted by businesses and by enterprises. Um, so, you know, typically the, um, uh, the way that the, the, the blockchain distributed ledger industry has, um, uh, has embraced smart contracts is to take traditional programming languages and kind of glue them on top of the blockchain platforms and encourage people to write distributed applications in those languages like um, Solidity uh, or Kotlin or Java and so on in the case of Corda. Um, and, uh, and they're very closely baked to the, you know, the semantics of the underlying platform. Um, they tend to involve the same sort of uh, computer programming concepts that we're familiar with of um, sending messages and checking uh, values and variables and things and operating in this quite systems focused context. And Alex, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, thank you. We um, approached, uh, yeah. Uh, we approached um, things looking differently at Digital Asset. We, we had a lot of freedom um, to innovate here and we decided to think about smart contracts as a discrete problem space in its own right, rather than an adjunct to a blockchain. Um, so what we did is we created from the ground up a language which uh, embodies those concepts of business practices and workflows right at the very heart of it. Um, we were able to dispense with all of the stuff, all the mechanics about how um, messages are passed on an underlying ledger or how state is retrieved and, and validity is checked and so on uh, and really just focus entirely on uh, on the on the mechanics of the business process um, so we created this ground up language for smart contracts which we'll see a little bit of in a minute uh, my colleagues will be getting into a demo of that um, and uh, we created that in such a way that it can run on top of any underlying distributed ledger or blockchain or indeed database uh, there's a, a a complete yet growing list at the bottom of the page here, um, where um, the subject of today quarter is right in the center. Um, and uh, we um, have looked at all the blockchains, looked at all the databases, understood what the, the general concepts and how they map between each other, and come up with a neat abstraction that allows us to create an integration for DAML uh, to run on top of any ledgers. The really interesting thing comes where you create an application in DAML that runs on top of DAML for Postgres, for example, which is not a distributed ledger, it's just a database, but it's a very nice prototyping tool. Um, you can then move that without recoding onto DAML for Corda. Uh, you can uh, create your application targeting Corda on, uh, on Chainstack's platform and grow your use of that on Chainstack, take it into production. Um, you can bring your application from Sawtooth at your internal innovation shop 
uh, create it and then deploy that on chain stack and again take that into production. This is um, an extremely powerful way of decoupling your choices about how to develop your application from the platform upon which you run it. Um, when you think about the uh, the decision tree and all the risks you have to evaluate as an enterprise about whether to build and invest in a distributed ledger, the coupling of your development to the platform is actually a pretty big one. Um, without DAML, your day one decision on what ledger to develop your application on becomes a permanent decision that's baked into the application forever. If you want to port it, you have to tear the entire thing apart and rebuild it in a different technology. With DAML, that risk is, is eliminated completely. You build it once in DAML, you run it anywhere that you like. Uh, and then if we move, please, um, on to the last slide. Thanks, Alex. Um, specifically about DAML for Corda, which again, we're going to talk about today. Um, the, the, the integration that we've built here works on Corda Enterprise or Corda Open Source. Um, we, uh, I may be stepping a little ahead of the game, but we, uh, we'd like to run this on Corda Net via Chainstack as well. I think that's something that we're, we're, um, we're exploring how that's going to work soon. Um, and it brings you basically the full power of DAML, uh, transaction privacy and so on, directly to, um, to a Corda network. Um, I, uh, much of the stuff that's on this slide here you can read. I'm not going to go over it. Uh, we are going to explore some of this in the remaining part of the webinar. So I will uh, end my talk here and hand over. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Thank you, Tim. Um, that, that, was, that was great. Yeah. Uh, Simon, the floor is all yours. I can see you're very keen. <laughs> Let's go. I will stop sharing. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah. And then you should be able to see my presentation. Yeah. Which is here. And let me start the presentation. Hopefully, everyone can see that. Uh, my section of this talk is about discussing uh, one of the things we did in preparation for this event, which was to take uh, an existing core app which had been developed by Chainstack and port that over onto uh, DAML running on uh, Chainstack's DAML for Corda node. This part of the talk is really about what we learned doing that and, uh, and essentially then diving into to how that was the case. Um, so, so really we only found out what we learned at the very end of it we were, we were sort of thinking about the conclusions and the like, and uh, I think this sums it up nicely. Uh, what we learned in porting was that in doing so, we have managed to replace the contracts and the workflow sub-projects with a single demo file, making the application easier to reason about and maintain. And we sort of asked ourselves a question, but how? How were we able to do that in that, you know, the, those sub-projects are uh, have code in there, they're, they're, they've got quite a lot of code and they must be doing stuff. How can we get away with, with um, not having them anymore? So that's kind of what we're gonna dig into for the rest of this mini session uh, and hopefully take some learnings away. If we start by looking at the, the demo contract itself, which is probably minimal. So I will get it up here. Now, what you're looking at here is the DAML code IDE. And what we see is really uh, one thing about this application was that the actual contractual side of it was a, a, an absolute minimum in that it really is just a single contract uh, and it's really uh, giving a distribution rights from a major distributor to, to a minor distributor. Um, this is the entire <laughs> Um, DAML contract, it really is not much more than that. Usually DAML contracts would be, um, would be a lot less code than say, um, maybe the, the equivalent in, in Kotlin, but it would still be, there'd still be a lot more functionality. Uh, if you look at the blog post, you'll see what a more end-to-end -end ticket distribution type DAML contract can look like. There's a link to an example of that. Um, this one is fairly simple. It's only got this clause at the end, which is, ensuring some things about the input parameters. One interesting thing to notice about doing the, working with DAML is that we're in the IDE here and the bit above this green line is the actual contract. The bit below is a test. 
and built into the IDE is the ability to run this test and display the results, uh, which we see on the right hand side here. Uh, and quickly, uh, before I move on to explain what this is doing, this is three clauses here, one a valid case, which is what is resulting in this valid distribution. And then two other cases testing the, the exception cases. One is trying to create an event with zero tickets and the other is trying to create an event with a zero length event a description. And both those uh, we're expecting to fail and, and must have failed by the fact this script results is, is passing. I think that's an exceptionally powerful thing about DAML, uh, that ability to have that very fast iterative learning loop uh, where you're not really having to run any, any clients or any servers or do any real compilation steps. Uh, that's one of the major reasons why developing in DAML is so fast. Uh, if I go now back to the slide, um, we we'll look at the what was in the sub projects and why they uh, we we don't have that that type of code or how that code is transformed in in the DAML land. Starting off, if you look in the con, if you look at a typical contracts project, the main thing is maybe the transaction verification. So the verify message and what that is doing is checking that all the states that come along in the transaction as a whole form a valid a valid whole and someone hasn't um, manu hasn't constructed one which um, uh, for example double spends or or, or, or or I don't know spends once but delivers two bicycles let's say uh, with demo the transactions are not manually constructed but they are automatically constructed as a result of applying a command to a a con a, or a number of contract states um that is an that is an automated thing and the rules of demo will really determine what the final transaction looks like this has the what you get for free if i take from the taking this approach is that when that transaction is distributed to other nodes the way they can they can verify it is they can reapply the same command to their local state that they've already verified and they should get a matching transaction and that and that is their way of saying okay this is valid and they will accept it into their into their vault um, so that's 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 one thing you don't have to you you, you get most of the way with um, we still had one line that ensure line which was verifying the arguments but apart from that there was no other uh, transaction valid verification required um the contract project also has the state i mean we had state two uh the, the state in daml is really this bit here it's really a temp uh, the templates are immutable um or rather the contracts are immutable so once a contract is created from a template it really is, it never changes, and that is the contract state. So that is already captured, you might say, in the DAML very explicitly as being the parameters to the template. The commands um, in, in a quarter, those have to be defined each time individually in the Kotlin or Java code. In, in uh, the land of DAML, the commands are really the choices that you have or the to exercise on a contract here actually we don't have any because it's that simple or the act of creating a contract itself is a command those are um, are the same across all daml contracts and you get that to some extent out of the box there doesn't we don't, we don't you don't need to hand code a creating a contract will give you the right to create that contract you don't need to add a command to do that so now we move on to the other sub project, which was the workflows. And we think about what's in there. The first thing we have is the ability to start the flow, which is usually via this annotation startable by RPC. With DAML, every single command that I say you, you get for free, you have a right to submit and the ledger client will allow you to submit that. Now, as a convenience, uh, it's possible to generate bindings that make those um, the things like the distribution way easier to work with. And there are bindings that can be constructed for uh, JVM, uh, Java-based languages, JavaScript, uh, or indeed Python. Moving on to the next thing you see a lot in the workflows is a lot of transaction building. As I touched on before, 
uh, the transaction is a consequence of applying a command to the state. Uh, no manual construction of the transaction is required. Validation, uh, again, that has to be done at the, the remote end or from, your, from uh, if you're receiving a transaction from someone else, you need to check that what they're sending you is not a fake or something that couldn't, that couldn't really or shouldn't really exist. And the way we do that, as described again earlier, is that we can reapply the command to our locally stored state and check that the transaction we, we generate matches the one that has been provided to us. And if it, if it does, we are then safe to uh, store that into our vault. Um, other things that the workflows do, uh, signing, of course. Um, uh, Corda allows sort of sophisticated signing patterns, I would say, or which can be useful. Um, in a way, sometimes less is more, though, and I think that's the case in DAML. In DAML, really, because we the, the prevailing pattern is the one is called in, initiate accept, means that as a someone making a, an offer to somebody else, uh, the only person who has to sign the fact that that offer is being made is the person making the offer. Uh, if the person who the offer has been made to, so for example, if I, if I offer to deliver a dozen apples to Tim. I can make a contract and, and uh, send that to Tim, and Tim will then have the right to accept that offer. And it's only at the point he accepts those, uh, that he wants those apples that he's gonna pay for them, that he countersigns that contract. Um, and because, because we have this sort of well-defined rules about who needs to sign and when, there's no need for custom signing collections or, or gathering, as you might say. Um, the, other, the next thing is transaction distribution, which is the uh, things you see as finality flows and subflows and typical Corda, Corda um, workflow projects. Here, uh, because parties and more importantly, what role the party is playing in the DAML transaction is a, well, is a first class feature and, and well defined and standardized, the actual set of parties who should have visibility of that of a created contract is very well defined and they will they will be delivered a copy of that contract um, again there is no choice about that and so there's no manual coding and and in a way that's great and every, every, every time you save a bit of manual coding you save the chance of uh, making a mistake um, so the more you can get a, a tried and tested approach, uh, i.e. with DAML, that in, to some extent, the, the safer you're going to be. Finally, transaction persistence, sometimes done manually in the workflows, every transaction, once it's been notarized in DAML encoder, um, will be automatically persisted to the vault. Uh, so if, I think that is pretty much it now. Um, if you want to find out more, uh, of course, there's a DAML website, there's a, a detailed step-by-step explanation of the uh, porting process with more detail. Uh, if you want to find out more about the initiate search so accept pattern, there's a, uh, there's a uh, blog article on this location. That is sort of, I think, all I needed to go over from the point of view of the, the kind of background to the porting as opposed to the, the, pra the practical demonstration. So I'll at this point hand over to Eugene to talk about how to spin up change that. All right. Awesome. Uh, let's move to the practical part of this event, which is uh, always the most uh, interesting one. Um, so basically what we're going to, so this, this event has a long story because as Simon just uh, demonstrated, he basically took an existing core app, which was built by our team a long time ago for educational purposes to show how to use a core down chain stack and he ported it on Damo. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna take the same uh, application, which was ported to the demo language and launch it on Chainstack, but instead of launching it in native uh, Corda way uh, by uploading a Corda app, we're gonna launch it on top of a demo um, uh, runtime, which will be running on a couple of Chainstack nodes. So uh, we will basically move on top of the level of abstraction of a node uh, of a particular protocol to the level of, uh, of DAML, which actually uh, supervises the overall uh, flow because you can actually launch um, DAML applications on top of any protocol. And that's the, that's the power of it. And that's 
uh, why we at ChainStack are super excited to have Damo as part of our offering. Um, so this is how ChainStack looks like um, uh, on a daily basis. So basically you have a bunch of projects uh, if, you, um, if you have used it for some time. Uh, you can create a new project and we have two types of projects. One is a consortium project and one is public chain. And consortium projects, you can create new networks, like uh, you can use protocols like Corda, Hapledge Fabric, Quorum. Um, in public chain, you can uh, launch public nodes on, on, on uh, networks uh, like Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, or actually public Corda networks as well. So you can use DAMO and Corda on either private or consortium networks uh, and also on, on, on public Corda networks like, um, like Corda Network, Corda Network UAT in the same way. Um, so I have here a project that we created specifically for this event a couple of days ago. Uh, when we go into the project, we have uh, uh, all our networks here that we deployed. Uh, in this case, we have one network, which is called Demo Network. Um, we can create another network and, and that will show the simplicity of how uh, you basically provision anything uh, on, on Chainstack. So let's call it a uh, uh, production network. And let's use uh, uh, Corda as a protocol. Um, so we can choose some parameters for this network. So for instance, consensus algorithm. Um, then we can choose the deployment options and we will uh, see what's going to be deployed. Uh, so we try to be very transparent on uh, what's going to be deployed and how much uh, would it cost. Um, so we can choose any location that we want. So we support uh, multiple clouds uh, today. Um, so let's say for the sake of the demo, let's choose uh, Azure uh, in London. Um, uh, and we can actually go to our documentation to read more about Corda network structure. Uh, it's, it's very, um, it's very uh, uh, well explained in, in our documentation. But in short, there will be a few components created after I, I will do a couple of more clicks. There will be a network map service, non-validating notary, and one uh, participant node that uh, I own as a creator of this uh, network. So as simple as that, uh, we just click next. We see all the summary, so we create a a uh, network called production network. Uh, the protocol is Corda. Um, uh, uh, we chose consensus algorithm, which is uh, one single notary. We host an Azure in the cloud. And here are the nodes that uh, we're going to have. Uh, what is cool about Chainstack that we provide all the service nodes for free. So basically, you pay just for the participant nodes that you um, provision in the network and everything else uh, that uh, is not actually uh, required for you to transact. Uh, we take care about this and we uh, we provide it uh, free of charge. Then you click create network and then in, in a few minutes it will be it will be deployed uh, uh, completely automatically. Uh, what's also cool about Chainstack is that you can uh, manage members of the project and you can invite uh, different parties uh, to collaborate with you on, on the project. So in this case we have two parties uh, who are uh, in this project. One is Chainstack, one is Digital Asset. Uh, so because we, we have this demo project and we can invite any other uh, member by just providing an email. So this uh, uh, person will receive an email with an invitation, needs to register and he will be part of this project uh, or she. And um, they will see the same, um, um, the same table uh, with networks and they can participate in these networks, uh, right? So we have this demo network built with just two nodes um, uh, for the sake of the demonstration. We can see our participant nodes. One is owned by Chainstack, one is owned by Digital Asset. Uh, you may ask, OK, I invite a member, but he will be able to see my nodes and see my node details and so on. Uh, it, it, it's not true, because uh, now I'm looking at the Digital Asset node, and I can just see the legal name, which is required for me to transact uh, with this uh, party on the, with this node. Uh, and uh, if we take a look at the node that I own um, as, uh, as a, a user of Chainstack organization, I can actually see much more details. I can see the ports and, 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 and username password to access my node. Um, so next, what is cool about Chainstack is that it's a full stack platform. So basically you can run uh, a network and you can invite participants and also you can install applications. So uh, in this case, um, on my node, which I own and which is uh, deployed in London, I have a few core apps installed. And they are uh, digital asset core apps that uh, basically implement integration between digital asset runtime, uh, the demo runtime, and uh, core app runtime. So we can observe these uh, core apps. We can see when I install it and uh, 
uh, some metadata. Also, I can remove it if I want. I can install new core apps, so it's uh, extremely flexible. And you do it in the same way with a couple of clicks in the UI. Um, and that's basically it. So now we have a, a fully um, um, running network uh, on Chainstack uh, with the participant nodes, uh, with service nodes, as I mentioned, like notary and network map service. Um, and now we're going to run uh, an application which is built uh, on DAML and was ported by the native uh, uh, Quora application. Um, I have some sneak preview of this application, uh, which is running on uh, top of my node, which is uh, Chainstack London. Uh, so uh, uh, Simon built a, sm a, a small but uh, quite sexy UI that uh, we use for this application. And um, now I'm here and uh, you see that there is no um, distributions and we're gonna do ticket distribution as uh, Simon mentioned. And you can see my uh, identity here. So it's a double identity that uh, um, I have on top of my um, change the quarter node and the double runtime, which is running on top of this node and I have no ticket uh, distributions. And now uh, getting back to Simon so that he uh, can demonstrate how we basically deploy um, the double application and how we, how we start interacting with it. Brilliant. Simon, you need to unmute. <laughs> so uh, as we are tweaking and, and getting okay. ready, uh, are there any questions from the from the audience? Anything that you want us to check out or anything you would like to ask directly to Simon, Tim, or Eugene? Uh, keep posting on the on the main chat. Uh, we are typing, but we can also ask um, uh, on live. I can see that everything is ready. Simon, good to go. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, we we've we've built this uh, before, maybe before. But I, th I thought I'd go through the steps to show how it's relatively straightforward to get this going. So I have my demo that we saw earlier. It lives inside here. There's the contact we saw earlier inside Visual Code, and I'm going to compile that, which is like that. And that's constructed a jar file, which is a um, an application archive. Now that's uh, the the uh, daml encoder nodes um, can run any type of archive. And that's how to some extent daml gets its portability. So let's let's upload this archive. Uh, it will do a this utility that ships with daml, which is called daml, which has a lot of sub commands, a bit like git. Uh, what this one does, it will upload the die that we've just built to the host running at this location to quickly flip back um, to what Eugene was saying. Uh, if we go back to our demo network and, and DA London, that is the name here, is the host name and the, uh, and the ledger port in this case is 10,000. So let's just run that and we can see is that quickly it's uploaded it. The next thing we would need to do is create parties because um, uh, well, essentially uh, by default a node will not have parties and there can be, uh, each, yeah, there's a one to many grouping between nodes and parties who can, who can operate through that node. So here I'm going to create a party where the hint name is Simon for me and we'll see I've created this party here. Now, next I'm going to do is to go into the actual, you might say the application that was ported. We can, uh, we can build that too. Won't take very long. Uh, and then we can, we essentially the one of the porting is that we have to, we have to tell the server application by a config where a, a few details, it needs the ledger host and the port so it knows where to connect to. The server port is the server it's gonna serve on locally. And the distributor is you might say who we're running as, which is me. So let's do that. Um, that should be fine. The cat server slash, oh, so the com. Yeah, that's, that, that's all good. And now we can start the application. Um, before we do that, we're going to <clears throat> run a navigator, which this is the, uh, you might say the, uh, 
um, tool which comes built in with, uh, just do this, that comes built in with DAML, uh, just to show how that works as well before we run the main UI. And if I go back to here, that you'll see is running on 4000. We'd go to localhost 4000. And I log in as me. We see we've got some distributions already. Okay, um, that should be good. But we've got, we're now going to, that was just a background. We're now going to switch over and we're going to use the main application that we ported, uh, which is run using run server. As we configured before, that should be running on port 77. And yes, it is. So let's flip over to there. Localhost. Okay, and we've got some. Aha, uh -huh, okay, yeah, we've got some, we've got some contacts here, but let's distribute some more. And we're gonna go distribute it to Eugene. And let's create a uh, hundred tickets. Uh, event. Right. Um, uh, demo. Okay, we're gonna create that distribution. And that says that it's done it. So then if I refresh this page, we haven't, the, the, the UI was largely uh, as it was, um, we were able to port it without changing anything. And we can see this has been, uh, I now have this smart contract locally. And I think what the plan is for me to stop sharing at that point and Eugene will pick it up and he'll see, show that this contract is indeed with him. Are you ready for it, Eugene? Sure. Okay, I'll stop sharing now. So I just uh, refreshed my screen and now I see all the uh, existing distributions that uh, uh, Simon has loaded and also the new one. So that was pretty fast. Um, I can also create a distribution and here I have Simon because he's a known distributor uh, for me already. I will create some very special events. So I will have just VIP tickets. So I will have five. Uh, and let's say it will be uh, um, Lady Gaga in London. Uh, 2021. So I will create this distribution. Um, it's committed to Ledger. So if uh, we switch back to uh, to Simon's screen, we should be able to see this distribution on, uh, on his Ledger as well. Okay, I'm unmuted. I'm going to refresh now. And oh, hey, there we have it. I mean, this is a very simple demo. I mean, I think that was to some extent the idea. We've only got a limited amount of time, and we didn't want to be distracted by the complexities of a particular application. It's more to demonstrate, as much as anything, the you know, leveraging the power of um, DAML and DAML on Corda on chain stack, um, which I think is what we've managed to do here. Um, now with that, I think I can hand back to Alex for, or, or Eugene, whoever wants to pick it up for, um, uh, for the next, for, the, for to maybe the conclusion. Simon, be, before we wrap up, I have actually a couple of questions that have come up from the, from the audience. They are asking, uh, in this demo, you're running Jamal service, not Corda nodes. Uh, is that true? Is, is that correct? No, we are, we are running, uh, maybe it's better, we are running, uh, Corda nodes, and then we are running DAML on top of on top of that. You might say, uh, in a practical terms, essentially the DAML will speak to a uh, another proxy, and that proxy then speaks to the Corda and to those Corda apps that Eugene Eugene showed earlier. So we are very much running on top of Corda. The, the all these smart contracts here will exist inside the the Corda vault um, and, and on both Eugene and my, my hosts. So basically uh, Corda node is used uh, as a uh, reconciliation layer here and uh, is used for all the blockchain properties that uh, you might want like immutability and traceability. Uh, we also use a notary service as a, 
as Corda has to basically prevent double spend uh, and all that. And basically, you can port this application with ease to any, any given protocol. So if you want to run the same application on Fabric, uh, easy. So you can use Damo on Fabric, and you can use it on Chainstack. And you can basically run the same application, and you can try it on the different protocol. And you can compare the performance, for instance. Um, or you can just uh, have your own like hands-on experience on how to work with uh, uh, Damo on, on, different, on top of different protocols. Uh, but in essence, blockchain protocol here, like uh, Corda or Fabric, for instance, is more like a, a reconciliation layer for all these uh, transactions and smart contracts that are written on, on double language. That, that's so interesting. And I've seen quite a bit of uh, conversation going on. Tim, you have been typing super fast. And I can see there's been a lively conversation on, on both the question of Tamil's uh, smart contracts and the law, <laughs> it's such a big topic. And I admire your ability to, to, to type it all out in such a clear way. I don't know if you, if you want to make any, any comment uh, for the sake of everyone else in, in this area. Yeah, um, yeah, it was an excellent question. Um, the, the point I want to make is, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't legal advice, I have to say that. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, the a lot of the discussion about the, the legal um, standing of smart contracts comes from um, the, uh, you know, the Ethereum chain, right? That, that's a lot of people's interest in, you know, if I, if I commit some ether to this smart contract, is that something that I can wriggle out of later on? Um, and the other whole intent of those Nick Zobo style smart contracts was to answer that question in the, neg in the negative, right? No, you, you can't wriggle out of it. This is, a, this is an agreement um, and it has the full standing of law. Uh, it just happens to be executed by a computer. Um, in Daml terms, it's a little bit more pragmatic than that because we're not um, we're not directly um, transacting cash or virtual cash using Daml. What we're doing here is um, governing a, a process or an evolving agreement between different parties. With people come together, they agree that they're going to do a particular business transaction on um, uh, a network mediated with Daml smart contracts. That that piece itself is. Um, a consequence of them entering into a separate legal agreement that they're going to do business together, right? They have some sort of buyer-seller relationship or they have a, a partner relationship and that, that, that governing framework is still the law and core. Where DAML gets interesting is that you can, um, you can use, and, and we've had legal opinions um, that affirm this, but you can use the, the audit trail of, of, of active DAML contracts um, as evidence in court that a party has committed to do something at a particular time. They've agreed to deliver money. Uh, they've agreed to deliver securities in exchange for that money. And if either party defaults, that audit trail and those DAML contracts, the, the, the full compatibility, and it's in the chat, I won't, I won't restate what I wrote there, but the full compatibility back to basic contract law is such that that does end up serving as strong evidence in front of a judge that um, the default should be resolved in favor of the, of the party that was wronged. Um, so they're, they're not themselves a replacement for contract law, but they're an extremely strong uh, and legally compatible framework for um, governing uh, the computer side of a process that exists between two parties in the real world. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if we ever did a press release or a case study on those legal agreements. Um, if we did, I'll share it with you, Alex, and then perhaps you could uh, you could stick it up on your um your social media related to this and when and, uh, that can be read by those who are interested. Absolutely. And, and we are planning to send out a follow up email with the video of this recording and any additional resources that we can we can uh, make available to the community will be more more than welcome. I think everyone, at least personally, I find that topic super, super fascinating. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Um, OK, well, mm. I have qu quite a range of few questions coming through. Um, I imagine that this is probably for for Simon. Uh, they're asking, uh, is a proxy adapter layer between uh, the Daml server and the DLT? Um, the proxy, we, the, all the, uh, you might say the, all the things like the, uh, the, the Daml navigator or the Daml ledger commands and indeed the ledger client speak uh, uh, Daml ledger API uh, that is that there's the, the, what the DAML on Corda does is interpret that runs on Chainstack's node, is interprets that 
And then uh, you might say then uh, as that, that's the person or that's the process that interacts with that, uh, that endpoint. It will then translate that into terms that Corda understands before calling on the, the Corda Corda apps to do the move, to do the, uh, you might say the, all the things that you usually do in a, in a Corda app. Um, including yeah, the distribution of the transactions, the persisting of the transactions to disk, the, the, uh, the snapshotting of the transactions um, uh, and, and, and other messaging. So, uh, and communicating with nodes. So all that is done, you might say by the cord apps, but the coordination of those cord apps is done via the, the DAML on cord server, which, which sits in between, you might say the client and the encoder itself. I hope that is clear. Sure, <laughs> if, if, if there are follow-up questions, I'm sure <laughs> that, that will come through. And I actually have one question for Eugene that has come through earlier, uh, just after your pre initial presentation on Chainstack. Um, uh, our community is asking how to connect API to the front end uh, as Chainstack goes. Um, I, I, I know that we do have a number of resources and guidance available, but uh, in a nutshell, Eugene, what, where can people understand um, and learn how to connect their, you know, the Chainstacks API to their front ends? So first of all, I would highly recommend to go through docs.chainstack.com slash tutorials. We have a lot of uh, uh, very detailed tutorials, including the ones uh, with, uh, with the front end, and uh, that uh, you will learn how to interact between um, the UI and uh, um, like the web server backend and also the ledger. So um, there is no there is no general answer to this question because each protocol is different. So for Corda, basically what you have usually as a best practice, you have the ledger layer, which stores the data. And then you have a, a, a web server um, service that communicates with the ledger and that basically implements uh, parts of the business logic that are not in the uh, core apps. And, and then you have a front end that is connected to this web server. So this is like very generalized uh, architecture of uh, an application on top of Corda. Uh, obviously uh, different people uh, implement it in, in a different way, uh, but this is like very generic uh, approach. But what I definitely suggest is to go through uh, some of the tutorials. Um, uh, obviously, I would highly recommend to go through Simon's tutorial on today's talk because it's very neat and uh, the application is quite simple so everybody can understand. And it also has a UI. Uh, so you will actually see how uh, all things work together and you can actually see the source code as well. And, and finally, may I add also, you can reach out to our Gitter community and I will be sharing you know, shortly all the links to the other community developers also on the, on the JAML side. Uh, there is a lively, lovely community of innovators and builders that are, you know, figuring it out uh, all along with one another. So definitely there is a, there is an effort to pull resources and, and maybe you will find answers to those questions also in, in that way. Okay, more questions. I, I am enjoying the questions. Uh, guys, keep, keep, keep them coming. Uh, I imagine this is for, for Simon. Uh, is there a double checking where Damo is also checking for double spending and Corda is also doing that? No. Um, as I did, when you, when you, we still use the Corda node tree. And one thing about when you run DAML on different platforms, while the rules of the language and we, we have a kind of very comprehensive test pack, we can verify that DAML behaves the same on, on every platform. The way it's implemented is very specific to that platform. So in the case of DAML on Corda, we still use the node tree to stop double spends. So if you imagine that a, um, a, contra uh, a contract in DAML will be backed onto a bit of double, a, a bit of cord estate uh, in a transparent way, uh, at the point you go and spend, uh, you, well, exercise a choice that consumes that DAML contract, that will be translated into a cord transaction that consumes that cord estate. Um, and, and that quarter transaction will be uh, notarized. And it's at a point of notarization that the, that the 
it will be allowed if that con if that state has not been consumed it will be disallowed if it has been preventing the double spend hope that makes sense <laughs> And if not, I'm pretty sure there will be a follow-up questions on the back of that. <laughs> awesome. I have one more question from, from our community. Uh, can there be a disparate reconciliation layer in the same ecosystem? For example, cord on one node while a hyperledger fabric on another? That's a very uh, uh, cool question, I think. And uh, we should uh, apply like uh, general computer science knowledge here, <laughs> I think. so. Basically, different nodes in the network, in any computer network can transact if they are in the same network, right? Obviously. So if you have a totally disconnected fabric network and if you, and, and then totally disconnected quarter network, then obviously they cannot transact. Um, so basically here we're talking about more like, I think Tim mentioned this uh, briefly in the chat. So we're talking about application uh, interoperability so we can use the same application on different ledgers, but not necessarily they, these ledgers are connected to each other in the end because you still have all this networking involved that you need to go through. So for um, nodes or network interoperability, there are other projects that are quite exciting, uh, like Hyperledger uh, Cactus, like Canton that is mentioned by team as well. So these are uh, targeted to implement the network layer interoperability so that in the end, you can have a, a quarter network and fabric network and they can talk to each other through demo, which is which is launched on top. Uh, but this is something for the future, um, I think. Yeah. And now we need to um, basically uh, make this um, smart contracts more, more like a commodity so that there are so many networks that they actually have a real need to transact to each other and then I'm sure that technology will be there to, to connect them. Yeah, we're, we're building precisely that technology to allow um, cross, uh, cross platform interoperability and data exchange. Um, today, the, I put this in the chat as well. Today, today the applications themselves are portable across ledgers. Um, data can migrate across ledgers, but in terms of interop uh, itself, that's, um, that's something that's coming uh, next year. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, everyone. I know it's been like super packed, so fast paced, but I'm pretty sure we covered most of it and we had also some time uh, to get some questions. Thank you, everyone, to, uh, for all the speakers in the community and the support team um, that has come from both the DAMO, uh, Digital Asset, and, and Chainstack. Thank you, Eugene, Tim, and Simon. It's been great to have you uh, as part of this, you. Uh, this webinar. Thank you. I hope it's been a great opportunity for everyone to get direct access to the makers, to innovators that are bringing um, a, a simplified inter blockchain enterprise experience uh, to the entire blockchain community as a whole. Here you have uh, some of our contact details. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out, um, whether that's on LinkedIn or drop us an email. We're also very active on social media. I know that after today's event, uh, we will spend quite some time uh, <laughs> responding to social media messages. We will also be sharing the video recording of today's. So if you have joined a little bit later or there are things that you want to go through again, um, just, just please you know, uh, bear with us, uh, give us about 12 hours or so <laughs> and the video will be up and running. We will also be sharing again uh, the wonderful uh, blog post uh, that Simon, Tim and the rest of the, of the team at, at DAMO has prepared uh, to walk through uh, step by step. Uh, on the use case that we have seen today. And we will also have opportunities along the way for new events and new promotions. I know that there is currently a promotion going on on Chainstack. If you are if you are itching to now to try, I'm pretty sure we made a compelling case. <laughs> I hope that's, a, that's the case. Uh, do go uh, to chainstack.com. And if you follow, follow through, uh, I will also be posting in the follow-up email the link. Uh, you will be able to access an exclusive promotion where you will be getting um, some uh, $250 of uh, free credit to experiment uh, using Damo for Corda on Chainstack. Uh, that's, that's all for me. Uh, um, I, I want to add that we spoke a, a lot about precision engineering today, but I should admit that uh, event precision engineering is here as well. And I probably have never been on the session with such precise timing. So we are exactly one hour <laughs> after we started. And I think um, Alex, thank you for moderating this session. It was great. Thank you, Eugene. 
thank you everyone uh take care and i will see you at the next event <laughs> bye everyone bye bye okay, bye bye, bye thank you